or eight. And my mom knows this now, but she would have killed me had she found out about it. We had some chicken in the fridge, right? We had no oil or no flour. I went to the neighbors and I asked the neighbors to borrow some oil and flour. They said, what you want to borrow that for? It's because I want to fry some chicken. I'm seven, I'm eight, first grade, <laughs> second grade. The chicken would have been just as bloody and burnt, but I was going to <laughs> But it was that early that I was learning to, to cook. And my cousins would come over and even that young, I was cooking, cooked a steak once. And this is way off, but I just, it just, when you talk about it, it makes you remember these things. But my cousin still talks about it to this day, about how I cooked a, a little cheap steak and had all of them fighting over it, like dogs over a piece of meat. <laughs> and I was easily nine or 10 years old. So I've been doing this a long time, mm -hmm. um, but it was it's off of the shoulders of my grandparents and great grandparents and those stories mm -hmm. that, that they have. And I love too, just the idea of nostalgia. I mean, I think another sort of level leveling of the playing field is thinking about sensory, right? Smells and tastes and how that connects all of us to one another and how that can be a, a, a way to also have these difficult conversations. Yeah, um, I've got a when, lot. We're in the, when we're in the kitchen, a sign that I know that, that we have done a wonderful job of interpreting is whenever people come in that don't look like me look at the table or look at what we're making and say, my grandma used to make that. And then their kids or grandkids look up at them and say, grandma, can we make that when we get home? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yes, I did my job. Yeah, and I think also, you know, we can talk about this for a moment and I'll get back to the questions, but, you know, the idea of Southern food um, being very American, you know, that is American food. I was, I was doing a podcast uh, the other day and, you know, somebody asked why I think Southern food is the quintessential American food. And of course, Southern food comes from these enslaved African-American cooks, right? So the whole, the, the, the legacy of that. But, um, you know, I had to think about it for a second. And then I realized that if you think about a quintessential plate, that every like that everything goes together like you go to new england there's not like a plate like yeah a lobster roll some clam chowder but it's kind of disconnected you know you go to the west coast it's like oh my goodness you know what do you eat there new york everything. city it's like everything you go to the south it is macaroni and cheese it's collards i mean that plate we can all see it just like you can see a thanksgiving plate there might be a variant but that is a plate of food and that is an american food plate right everything's so, brown yeah <laughs> With a little bit of hot sauce and maybe yeah. a little bit of green. But, um, you know, you think about that, and I watched you on at Christmas Tide, and you were frying chicken in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And you could smell that chicken when you got onto the site at Stratford. I mean, it was like, you know, those old cartoons with Pepe Le Pew, you know, like the smell was coming, and everybody's like, where's the chicken? Where's the chicken? <laughs> and the kitchen was packed. It was like, like, Seriously, standing room only, elbow to elbow, for it was like three hours of people coming yeah. in there talking to you and you talking to them. And every single one of them, and the majority of them were coming there not to see an African American cooking demonstration, but to visit the Lee's home and learn about that. And they found themselves with these, uh, I witnessed such enriching, moving conversations about food, having that moment happen with their kids saying, you know, I want to taste that, I want to eat that, that's just like grandma's. And, you know, to use food the way that you do it, to have these conversations is such a beautiful and powerful thing. So, it's a magic trick, man. It is, I, right? But you got to have good food to be able to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it was at, I think it was at Stafford. There was, it was a site anyway I was cooking. And, you know, we don't cook for the public. We eat everything later. Mm -hmm. I had a chicken back, Kelly. Mm -hmm. A chicken back and, and most people put it in a stock pot or they you know they throw it away I get 12 mm -hmm. pieces of chicken out of one chicken you know a lot mm -hmm. of people say they get I get 12 or more um so I had a chicken back it's my tester piece and somehow or another the way things were set up the lady got across the line and took the darn chicken back off the plate while my back was turned and when I turn around, she's greasy face, crumbs <laughs> on her mouth. Oh my God, this is so good. I'm like, lady, listen, <laughs> I know I can cook and I know that it was cooked well, but if you have an allergic reaction to pork because I'm frying in lard, this is going to be a problem. But you didn't get, I didn't give it to you. You stole it. 
See, that's what happens when your chicken smells so good, you can smell it down the street. You know, yeah. you get people stealing it when you're turning around. Yeah. Oh, it's and people so funny. Look, they ask me, they say, well, why don't you eat it? Because I've been smelling this all day. Yeah. I don't want it. Give me a, a milkshake. That is the <laughs> truth. Oh, my goodness. Okay, Robin asks, as an interpreter in a historic Virginia plantation, what would you hope I would concentrate on conveying to, to visitors about enslaved cooks? This is definitely one we can both talk about. So go ahead. That they existed. <laughs> that if you have those names, we talked about this um, before, but if you have those names, if you have any narratives about them, um, that's the focus. Start there um and 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 lay it heavy with it um there is no story of those enslaved africans um without the story of their enslavers um like the lees there is no story of the lees without the story of the africans of those enslaved africans and there's no story of caesar if we don't talk about uh he, uh Oh my lord, I'm losing it. Give me a name. Sonny. If you don't talk about Henry. Oh yeah. Henry you know, or Sonny? So, no, Henry. What Ludwell. Oh, Philip. 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 There's no yeah. story of, of Sonny or Caesar if we don't talk about Philip. If we you know, if we don't talk about the birth of Robert, you know, we we have to do it that way by honoring mm -hmm. those names. Um one of the the, the main focuses is also to actually use the kitchen um bring interpret if you don't have anybody who can interpret those people um bring people in to bring those kitchens to life those chimneys and, and hearts beg to be used again mm -hmm. they beg to be used again so um that's that's what i have for that no, that is the truth. And I think it's important to, you know, most plantations that they ha have records, they're going to list the cook. The cooks were typically one of the most valued um, enslaved people on the plantation. So you, you're, the likelihood of you getting a name associated with that cook is pretty high. And, um, and when you have that name, you know, you can, you can infer a lot, you know, watching Dontavia's cook or any other African American hearts cook, watch them doing their interpretations, you know, ask questions as you go to these programs, um, read as well. I mean, I, not to plug my own book, but it's, you know, it's a book completely about the enslaved cooks, what their life was like, what it was like to sleep in those kitchens, to work in those kitchens, to deal with the politics of the, the white enslavers and to sort of, you know, have a position of power of sorts, but still be enslaved. There's just so many ways that you can talk about them. And, you know, I think that the, the work is there and the, if you have a standing kitchen, you know, it really doesn't take that much to get those stories out there. And people want to hear them too. You know, there was a big fear. Uh, well, there still is, I would say, on a lot of plantation sites of talking about slavery. It's an uncomfortable thing to talk about, you know, it's for everybody. But you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable because this is history. Mm -hmm. And like you said, Dontavious, you know, there's we've been a lee site you know we are a lee site for for so long and the focus of our our interpretation and programming has been predominantly uh, focusing on the lee men not even the lee women and i've been there for two years and you know we're not we're still elevating the lee men absolutely we have a new tour that just came out just about you know the band of brothers but mm -hmm. i think in elevating the other voices and the other experiences you're able to see a little bit more clearly what life would have been like on a plantation because if you went to Stratford Hall in 1782, you would have seen, you know, the majority of the people there would have been enslaved African or African Americans. You would have seen women who have, would have, you know, had a role in the house and managing things. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a delicate balance, but thank you for asking that, Robin. And, and one more thing um, to that, whenever we uh, interpret the kitchens, whenever we, so say for instance, I buy a old 18th century home and it has an outdoor kitchen, it has a separate kitchen. Um, and I want to interpret slavery um, or interpret being cooking in that kitchen. A lot of times people want to set those spaces up so pristine and so untouched. But um, I believe it was you who mentioned how the, how the kitchen was, it was a, a messy place. It was always bustling that there was, you know, stuff like trenches in the middle. A lot of kitchens had trenches 
in the middle of the floor to be able to get rid of the the wastewater, you know, to be able to keep it clean. But it was a utilitarian building that was used. And and, and that would be one of the, the first things to do is to, to focus on the use of that. And I can guarantee you that Philip was not in there cooking. <laughs> He might have been in there trying to steal a piece of chicken or, you know, or a roll or something that Caesar had cooked, but... Yeah. Smelling the chocolate. Yeah, yeah. Dipping his hand down up. in there, you know? Getting a sip. Absolutely. But, but it's a, it's that marriage, and we have to learn how to merge those two stories. My, yep. my mother, my mother um, mentioned something a few months ago about how America is. We have called America a melting pot. Well, when you when you melt things, they all become one, right? It's it's it, America's not a melting pot because we are not the same person. Kelly, you and I are different. We are more like my mom says a salad bowl. I would say we are more like a pot of uh, black eyed pea soup. <laughs> you could see every single ingredient. Yeah. And each ingredient had its own distinct flavor, but all of those flavors put together made that pot of soup what it was. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it was just a pot of stale beans, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so we have to be able to tell that well-rounded story. I agree. So thank you for that question. Portia Hopkins asks, <clears throat> what would a typical day be like for someone who is enslaved working in a kitchen? Would they have access to the food pantry and be able to try different recipes and ingredients? When I visited Stratford, I remember the keys that the mistress would carry around the pantry with the pantry keys on it and that it was kept under close guard. How much autonomy would the chef have? So I can speak to Stratford um, specifically and to, honestly, a lot of plantations in Virginia, which I think are representative of plantations around the South and broader, but it depended on the plantation. You know, the abuse levers were different on different plantations, the relationships between the, the planter house and the planter family and the enslaved community was very different, but Overall, um, you know, the amount of labor that went into making these dinners for these large plantations, it was a lot of labor and it was, you know, it was time consuming, it was physically exhausting. And so, you know, the lady of the house, the white, you know, the plantation mistress of the house was not the one in there making all the food. And so, as you mentioned, she would carry the key. She would come down in the morning, you know, maybe unlock the butter, some sugar, some of the spices that were more expensive, and then lock it back up again. But there are several instances that I found in my research where, you know, the enslaved chef had the power to go to market, you know, were given, you know, money to go and trade things and were able to also plan menus. So it really depended on the plantation. And Dante, do you want to talk about a typical day in a plantation kitchen? You wake before the sun. Uh and you go to sleep after the sun, depending on the time of the year and the events that are going on. The work was, was constant. Um, most of the time, the enslaved cook lived in the kitchen or very close to the kitchen because they were really, there was really no separation between that work and that, that life. You know, it was one of the same. Uh, so, of course, it is long days, early mornings and late nights. Uh, for the enslaved cook because in the morning when the family is ready to get up, it's not, oh, let me go down and see what's in the fridge. No, it's, I know that on this day, we have to have this meal, we have to have this planned, you know, and it needs to be prepped. So all of that starts before the sun rises because when it's breakfast time, it is breakfast time and there should be no reason to ask where is breakfast. It should be there. Um, that is an expectation for the enslaved cook and all of those those people who were working in the house to ensure that the family was fed. Um, late nights, you're cooking those meals, but it's a lot of cleanup that has to happen in preparation for the next day that needs to happen. So a really quick way to answer it, you typically hear this about those who were working in the fields, um, sun up to sundown. Uh, but that's what it was. It was, they worked from before the sun came up or until the sun goes down, or some people even say from sun to sun. 
Thank you for answering that. All right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anonymous attendee asks, how would you encourage young black Americans to get involved with this sort of work? It has to be personal. Uh, it, it just does. That, and that's just the, the, a lot of times people ask me that um, from museums that, that work at museums and they want to increase their African American, African American visitation. You can't make anybody do this work. If, if you heard my introduction, I, I said that this was a call. I was called to this. There are many who actually do this and try to make a living off of it. If you're in it for the money, get out quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, it's it's hard to make a living off of off of this because you're gigging. You're literally gigging. You're trying to sell yourself to sites to try to get them to um, to, to pick you up and do these programs. Um, but it takes away from that conviction that you have of what it is when you're called to it so yes we get paid some of us now, i'm not a reenactor i'm a living history interpreter and yes i get paid but i can guarantee you every just about every dime that i get goes right back into my interpretation because clothing is expensive this is a very expensive if you would want to call it a hobby but this is a very expensive career um they would have to see themselves and I did a, another uh, webinar with someone about teaching African-American students history. And, and I used the same thing for this. Um, they, they, they will have to see themselves in the story. Um, and if sites are not comfortable with showing that side of the story, or they show half of it, a part of it, or can I say BS it? Mm -hmm. I said it, they kind of BS around the, the topic. People know the truth mm -hmm. and people research. There are a lot of African-American young people who are interested in the history and who would love to get into it. But you just got to tell the truth and you have to open the door. Once the door is open, you have to treat them fairly and as people. There have been places that I have gone and volunteered and was treated like the people I was interpreting. I didn't go back. <laughs> That's one reason why I created the Chronicles of Adam, because I control where I go or where I reach out to. Excellent answer. Bill Chapman, ooh, good question. All right, you ready for this one? Uh-oh. Somewhat in line, no, it's good. What has been your greatest moment of understanding and connecting to the ancestors when doing the work that you do? The moment I got a phone call while working at a historic site and said, you are interpreting as my seventh great grandfather. That moment dropped me to my knees. Um, and when, she, when the person on the phone explained to me who it was, and it all began to make sense, and she asked me to help her to connect the dots, it, that was a wonderful feeling because she trusted me with that. Unfortunately, the lives of the enslaved were not lives that were truly recorded like that. So those records were not around. So all we really know about her ancestor is uh, an age, his value, and his family unit. That's really all we know. Uh, so unfortunately, we couldn't connect those dots, but we connected her uh, and, and the rest of her family to that site. And for them, it was a homecoming. And for me, I wasn't there for that homecoming, but we started that process. And for them to be able to do that was one of the best feelings in the world. Mm. <clears throat> David Booth asks, uh, were you at all influenced by Edna Lewis? Where does she stand in the history of preserving the African-American food tradition? I was not. Edna, Edna is, 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 is contemporary. She's a little, little bit more contemporary. Um, 
but no, I, I was not, um, I am not a food historian. Um, I'm a living history interpreter. So with that, I, I have knowledge of a lot of different areas. Food is just something that I really love. Um, I have used a couple Edna Lewis recipes. I've cooked a, a couple of those at home and they're, they're wonderful. Um, and her contribution to um, the food world is phenomenal, but I cannot say that um, that she has been an influence on the interpretation that I do. I, my, biggest inter my biggest influence has been slave narratives. Um, and, 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 and that's it. Jeff, I, I let them talk sorry, to me. No, I was just saying, I just, I let them talk to me in their own voices. There's so, yeah, and there's so many out there. And for those of you that haven't read any at all, or have only read sort of the bigger ones, the Douglas, you know, the Equianos, um, you can go on the Library of Congress website and look under the American Memory section, and there are just countless slave narratives that are short. Some you could you know you could read twelve in an hour, you know, some of these. But the the information in there is phenomenal. It's a wonderful resource to not only understand more about enslaved um, African Americans, but just to understand about America, what slavery was like, and, you know, from, from their own mouths, like Dontavia said. Jeff asks, how would leftovers be preserved if there were any, or were leftovers not a thing? Leftovers were a thing. Leftovers were truly a thing. And a lot of times it wasn't necessarily they were preserved, they were just eaten the next day in a different form. So, uh, the frugal housewife has a uh, receipt for a chicken pie or a beef pie. Well, if we had chicken the night before and we couldn't eat all of it, guess what? We got chicken pie tomorrow. Um, <laughs> we have beef pie or pork pie tomorrow. It's just a way to be able to use those things very quickly um, because there was really no true refrigeration. And, you know, if you're from the South, once you're in the summertime, you wouldn't want anything that's been sitting because humidity has gotten to it and it's all like yuck. But um, <laughs> you figure out. A lot out of stomach problems it. back then. <laughs> uh, right, right. But growing up in my grandma's house, you, you ate a lot of the yuck. So you guys, no, I'm not going to mention it. But yeah, you, you, you eat a lot of it. So like the moldy bread and things of that sort, just pick the mold off and eat it. You know, somebody somebody sent me some bread and it was it was a little moldy, but you know, it's okay. I'm just gonna pick it off and eat it later, you know. That's just one of those things. Yeah. You get it used molded to it. during shipping. You know, th these things happen. You know, as long as the loaf wasn't destroyed, then guess what? You can still eat it. You can find a little core of some decent bread on the inside. Yeah, something from nothing. Exactly. <laughs> Dontavia <laughs> trying to keep a straight face. Okay, Helena asks, is the cornbread and milk you described considered gruel or porridge, um, or is gruel cooked grains and milk? I think of it as cooked grains and milk, but... It's cornbread and milk, because it's a cornbread that you crumble, and you pour milk on it as two different things. You don't cook it, you right. eat it like cereal. All right. Um, anonymous attendee asks, who were the cooks for and who was doing the actual reading of the cookbook? So some of the enslaved cooks were actually taught how to read. Again, going back to my comment earlier, you know, the mistress of the house did not want to be down there every day with her cookbook, you know, reading and instructing. Um, you had to, you know, you had to learn a little bit to be able to be able to cook in there and make all those things by yourself. Um, who were the cookbooks for? we can both answer that, but the cookbooks that were handwritten, um, and there were ones that were published, but when you got married, you would typically get, if you were a white lady of, of prominence during this period, you would get a, uh, a book of receipts, as they call it. You would write down, you know, the recipes that your mother's family or the enslaved chef, if, if, if you were in the South, would be cooking, and those recipes were then passed down and added to, and a lot of the enslaved, uh, cooks food and the food that came from the quarter that made its way up not only up from the quarter but from west africa made its way into these cookbooks as well did you want to speak to any of that dontavius so yeah the illiteracy was was a was an issue <laughs> honestly especially in 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 the south 
uh, like in South Carolina in the back country, you had a lot of people who were illiterate who just couldn't read. So um, those receipts, those recipes um, were, were ones that were passed down through oral history. Um, and of course they change. I, I read recipes. There's a particular pasta dish that, um, that matter of fact, Kelly had taught me um, and I made it, but I made it my way. I added something different. I added kale to it, to the sauce. Um, and it was good. She looked, she gave me the side eye, but it actually was really good. It looks um, good. Uh, but yeah, so you, you, you pass those things down. Um, and let's go ahead and dispel you, Kelly already dispelled it, but I just want to kind of reiterate the fact that all enslaved people were not illiterate. All enslaved people were not dumb. Um, they, they knew what they were doing. Um, we, we have to understand and to get rid of that whole victim mentality of the enslaved community. Um, they were scientists, they were chefs, they were architects. Uh, the, the only thing that was different about them was they didn't own their freedom. They didn't have that autonomy to be who they were created to be. Um, and, and respect it in that same way. Thank you for that. And also just to mention on the, uh, just one more thing is that, you know, a lot of enslaved folks too, because you can be punished if you were taught how to read because there were laws put forth, especially after Nat Turner's rebellion. But, Definitely. you know, they risked they risk their lives and their, their health and, you know, their safety to learn how to read and teach their children how to read. So there was a lot at risk in that too. Keisha Brown asks, I know the last time I saw you, you mentioned that Stratford Hall might be distilling whiskey. Has that happened? No, but maybe one day. Yes, one day, hopefully. Fingers crossed. <clears throat> was that, that, what was the word Justin left us with last time? Was it follow I can't oh, remember. Sure. Yeah, so the first program we did to kick off this whole series was with uh, Steve Bayshore, who makes the whiskey at Mount Vernon, and Justin Cherry, who's a baker, who'll be coming back. You'll see his uh, baking presentation in a few weeks. But um, they were talking about whiskey making and, and all of that. And I learned a bunch during that program, and I cannot remember the exact word. Um, Sarisha or Sarika, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Um, so excuse me if I just messed that up. My daughter is studying the roles songs played, yes, as escape plans were made. Were there cooking related songs that had hidden messages about escaping? That is an excellent question and I don't know. Do you know of any, Dontavious? I, I don't know of, of any. I don't know of any, but escape, if I can speak to the whole escape thing, Mm -hmm. um, I would love to. We, we oftentimes attribute the whole escape of the enslaved with the whole victim mentality of, oh, everything was awful every single day, every minute of that day. Um, and that, boy, if the slaves could run, they all would. Well, the reality is there were a population of people who were not brave enough to do it. Um, you had a large population of people who just, who would stay. Harriet Tubman herself said, I would have freed more if they only knew they were enslaved, if they only knew they were slaves. Um, this was a way of life. This was what they were. They were so beat down in that particular system that they couldn't see anything else outside of that. Um, so finding freedom or looking for freedom was not at the front of many people's minds. It was just, you know, dealing with the day to day. I'm in South Carolina. To escape from a plantation in South Carolina, as far south as we are, um, mm -hmm. you would get caught before you were freed. There have been many times that I have been, and there are quite a few plantation sites here that, you know, are preserved or that are now private residences that I look and I look at the landscape around it and there's no way that these people would have been able to escape, no matter how many songs you sing, or contrary to popular belief, you know, how they talk about the braids, patterns and stuff in their head, no matter what device you want to try to use, you still a lot of times would get caught before you were free. And that was another deterrent, you know, from them running away. And one more thing, when they did try to escape and run away, instead of running north, especially for our friends who live in Charleston in the low country, they would run south. 
into Florida because Florida, um, especially early on, was a free state. The Spanish controlled Florida in the 18th century. Okay. John asks, how long did Dontavius cook the soup? Very important question. I cooked it. The, the longest part was cooking the peas. You can't cook everything um, all together. So it's, you're building flavors. So I cooked the, the meat, it cooked for about an hour, to be honest. Um, and then I put the peas in. I did it that way because I had the time. Uh, but typically you would soak your peas and then you put your peas and your, and your meat and stuff in the pot and just let it go for a couple hours. Um, but I built the flavors and it took about, it took about two hours because between, yeah, it was about two, two and a half hours because we did it between those shoots. So, yeah. Judy asks, what is the origin of enslaved children eating from the, tr the trough? Um, did it start in Africa or here in the States? Um, I do, I want to address something here that I think is really important to address. Um, the ways in which enslaved children had to eat out of a trough that was literally made for animals in the States is very different than what you would see communal eating like in West Africa. So in West Africa, one pot meals were very common. Um, it was the way in which the community, if you lived in a village um, or even in a city, right, um, certain neighborhoods, you'd come together and you would eat. And so having a big pot with some rice and you know maybe they're making gumbo or some jollof or any of the stews they would have been cooking people would come together and they would just walk over and they would eat some of the food it was part of community right so it was a way of eating a lot of cultures um eat like that right you don't need a fork you've got you know east indian culture does this i mean there's there's tons of cultures that eat without utensils and so you know using eat a little bit of, bit of bread or just your hand to eat was a very common thing um that tradition in West Africa was then um, can be, if you don't realize what you're looking at, then superimposed onto what you saw in Dontavius's uh, slide that he wanted me to show, which is a very different thing. You have a sort of um, a tradition that was once warm and welcoming and beautiful, then being superimposed on top of um, the conditions of slavery, right? Where enslaved people and animals were considered very similar, they were treated poorly, and so you see the hardware, if you will, uh, the fixtures, if you will, of animals being used to then feed human beings. And if you can yeah. imagine the power of that, uh, visually, uh, culturally, emotionally, is very stark. So did you want to add anything to that, Dontavius? I just wanted to circle back to the, the quote from Frederick Douglass. Um, he says, the children were then called like so many pigs and like so many pigs did they come and devour. The, the, that, that, that one statement is so powerful because number one, they, the, the, the devour part, they didn't come and just eat but they devoured this food. So they were hungry. They were hungry. And because children were just children, and depending on their age, if they weren't of age to work, they didn't need all of the, the, the energy and the substantial things to, 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 to be fed to them. So they got what, was, what they could get just to keep them to grow. Uh, that that thing you. stuck out to me, man. And, and there there are so many other narratives. There there are some narratives that are the complete contrast mm -hmm. to Frederick Douglass. You know, mm -hmm. you, but no one plantation was the same. Exactly, and that's I think one of the most important things once you start to study this this history um, is knowing the diversity and experiences, and then yeah. you know it's it, it bleeds into everything. So thank you for asking that. Anonymous attendee, there's lots of you here tonight. Um, anonymous <laughs> attendee asks, <laughs> I know hey, that okra was, <laughs> hey, yeah. um, I know that okra was a vegetable that came from Africa and it was used in New Orleans and Louisiana area in the development of Cajun foods. Absolutely. Are there other vegetables that come from Africa that filled a void for enslaved people? Absolutely. And yes, the black eyed peas were one. Do you want to hit on this, Mr. So Williams? Everything that we did in these two shoots, the black eyed peas, the um, the okra, the, yeah. those peppers uh, that, that I mentioned, that fish pepper, um, even the peanut, um, those were things, the sweet potato, 
uh, or yam, I'm, I'm going to say the yam uh, is, is one that came over. And there is a, a group of people who believe that seeds were hidden and tucked in the hair of the enslaved so that, oh, I know that I'm getting ready to go to this new place, so I'm going to stick a seed in my hair and I'm, I'm going to plant it when I get there. That takes a lot of ingenuity. That takes a lot of planning and foresight to be able to do that. Um, I'm of the belief that on this journey, these European men who packed these slaves onto this ship were feeding them food that they thought that they would eat. And they lost a lot of those people because they were starving. Mm -hmm. They didn't recognize that food and they wouldn't eat it. Oh, white man is going to poison me. You know, I'm not eating that because I don't know what it is. So what better thing to do than to take the plants from what they had or seeds from those plants and then introduce them in a new land with the similar climate to what they had. Remember like those rice. people? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. those people, the rice came here as a means to feed the enslaved. <laughs> so uh, it, it just took off because, oh, this is good. You know, <laughs> this is this this works for, for, for me. Um, and then you have other other things, but those things came out of necessity, you mm -hmm. know. And like I said, that that foresight to be able to to stick a okra seed in my hair so that I can have an okra plant when I get there, that doesn't that doesn't hold too much too much weight with me. And it's hard to imagine too with the you know, the sort of violence of the slave trade and the, the wars that were happening in West and Central Africa and the kidnappings and all those things happening that that would actually play it out. And it's also important to remember too that the, the slavers that came down from Europe in the trade to then go down to West Africa, they would be there for a while. They didn't just kind of uh -huh. dip in for 10 minutes and leave. They right. were there, they were eating the food of the African slave traders and sort of commuting with them. And so I guarantee just like the, the white folks in Virginia were, you know, starting to think about the food of the slave quarters the food that those same people on those ships the white yeah. folks were eating you know in west and central africa were then like okay actually give me some of that like give me some of those okra seeds give me the watermelon mm -hmm. seeds you know i want to eat this and plant this in the quote new world so great mm -hmm. question okay um let's see oh margaret asks what age group for the kids book can't wait Listen, it's for everybody, even the big kids too. So it's gonna be a, a it'll be, um, so if you know anything about libraries or, or education, it would be an ebook. So it would be an easy read. So easily kindergarten, first grade. But the, the messages that are in it are for all age groups. I have a book called The Bell Rang and it's a children's oh. book and it's literally like four or five pages, uh, excuse me, four or five words per page. Um, easy for a kindergartner to read, easy for a kindergartner to understand. However, that book, when I read it, brought me to my knees. Oh. It brought me to reading it. And it, the first time I read it, I read it live. And I was like, wait a minute, I should have read this book before I got on this live. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, as an adult, it's nuanced in a way in which you get and draw so many things and, and the same way with, with the children's book that I have written. And I wrote my book years before I found this one. Um, and I'm like, dang, so I'm not crazy. Somebody just beat me to the punch. I can't wait. Uh, let's see. Oops, I just lost track here. Okay, Margaret asks, ooh, good question. How did you, Dontavious, get involved with Stratford? Uh, Kelly Dietz helped me with, I met her first uh, in Virginia at a college uh, and I was just doing storytelling. I didn't remember who Kelly was. I knew that she, because she was hosting the event and she actually gave me her book and the copy of The, the Cooking Gene. Those are the, your gifts and they get used very well. Um, mm -hmm. But I came home, slid those books on the, on the, on the table for about a month it sat. Um, and still wrapped up in that pretty, and I still have that ribbon, still wrapped up in that pretty ribbon. Um, and then we, our paths crossed again, and we, be, we learned each other more. 
I was only there to to come in, tell stories, do what I had to do, and leave the first time. Um, and she didn't know me. I didn't really know her. But when we worked together in that kitchen is <laughs> when that relationship was formed, when, when she became my sister, you know, because we cooked, we, we listened to good music, uh, and, and we made something out of nothing, literally. Um, a bunch of vegetables we turned into a wonderful meal. Um, and so after that, the opportunities began to come. When she started working at Stratford, um, she invited the Slave Dwelling Project with Joseph McGill to come. And I was on the docket to be one of the, the storytellers. And I, somehow or another, they fell in love with Adam. Uh, and, and so Adam has been invited back. Dontavious is just along for the ride. <laughs> No, it's been wonderful having you there. And I mean, you've really become an ambassador of our kitchen. And, you know, very soon here, you're going to be talking more about Caesar in the next program and yeah. getting his story out there. So it's in Stratford. We are absolutely lucky as can be to have Dontavious as an ambassador to our site. It's, it's, he's, you're a wonderful addition. And I, I love working with you, as you know. So well, thank you thank for asking you. that. And one more thing about Stratford. Stratford is like a place of healing for, for me personally. Uh, anytime I, I come, and, and that people are probably looking at their devices like, wait, what at a plantation? It's so much good energy at Stratford. Um, right at the, 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 the cabins or the, 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 the places where we sleep, not far from there is the African cemetery. Um, and just the energy of the space is wonderful. You're right there on the Potomac and at the cliffs, I'm able to go and just sit and just exist. It's like a sanctuary of sorts. Um, and, and it's magical. I went on a, while we were there for Juneteenth, I just toured the site and I went on a walk and there's a cabin that's like way off, you know, away from the site, mm -hmm. the pain cabin. And I wanted to go to it. And I'm like, that's going to be an easy walk. No. Virginia <laughs> Hills are no joke. And so I'm down the hill and I'm still got almost a mile to go. <laughs> I did it. I, I made that journey. But to get away from everything, all the noise, and to be able to sit at that cabin but look back at the big house, mm, mm -hmm. it was something so magical it was something so powerful about that moment and I was strengthened in that moment because this is a hard job yeah I might have seemed really jovial whenever I was doing the cooking but whenever you have to dig into these narratives to find these re these receipts these recipes mm -hmm. these different methods you also hear of some of those horrors you are uh, you find these things like Frederick Douglass talking about how the children devoured food like pigs. And you have to deal with that stuff. And to find mm -hmm. a site where you can find that peace means so much. Thank you. And you know, for those of you that have not been to Stratford, I had the same very sort of visceral reaction when I first visited there because it is so remote. And you step onto this 2000 acre plantation and the architecture is so striking. But the land, there's just something magnetic about that space. And everyone I've brought on, I'm getting goosebumps right now. Everyone I've brought on there, you know, onto the site to sort of talk about the history there, talk about everything from the birth of Robert E. Lee to, you know, to the famous brothers, to the Lee ladies, to the African and African Americans that were there on that site. Everybody that comes out feels that same connection to the site. And there is something very, I think, important there. And these are part of the stories that we're rendering and doing programs like this. But um, no, it's, I've heard that from so many people that come out there. And mm -hmm. so many people of African descent have come out and said, I've never felt this way in a particular plantation before. There's something very strong happening there. And the history is thick. Mm -hmm. It's very, very thick. You, um, you feel it. You feel it. When we did the, the libations, I think mm -hmm. I even shared this last time, but when, when they poured the libations and started calling the names, I was like, there's flies all around here. And every time I would, you know, swipe my arm because I thought it was a bug crawling on me, it got to the point where I was like, I know I don't have fleas. 
you know. <laughs> so I look at my arm and I have, I don't, I'm not a really hairy guy, but the little thin hairs on my arm stood up. They were standing up on my arm. And, and it meant to me that, yeah, I'm in the right place at the right time, you know. When I said Adam's name, it was like, whoa. When I said his wife's name doing those libations, it was like, gee, thanks. You know, those pats on the back kind of thing. I don't want to freak y'all out. The place isn't haunted or anything because I've slept there over and over again. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things when you do this work and you don't do it for yourself, you do it for the ancestors, you look for that pat on the back. You look for that. Um, and when you get it, man, I'm telling you, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Beautifully said. Pamela asks, Dontavious, do you use period cookbooks for your interpretation? If so, which ones do you recommend? The, um, the Frugal Housewife is one that, um, that I have used receipts from. Uh, the Kentucky Housewife is another that, um, that I have used receipts from. There are countless others. The Backcountry Housewife there's a there's a key term in there, housewife. Um, those are not just receipt books or recipe books. They have so many. They're they're literally books on how to be a wife. <laughs> um, and you have those receipts that are built into it. Um, that would be a, a good style of a book to write, um, to have your recipes uh kind of sprinkled through practical information um but yeah so those are those are books it tells you how to make soap and how to properly clean a, a, a chicken like it's so many cool things medicine, in those books. poison yeah venison <laughs> yeah what now tell me what what lee lady is gonna be outside chesting up a big old uh, deer yeah. And splitting it and skinning it and doing all this stuff. No, man. I don't think, yeah, those <laughs> ladies were of, of means. They were not going to be out there doing that in the yard right. for sure. <laughs> but it's a lot of different things in those books to be able to give you an idea of what life was like uh, for everyone uh -huh. uh, on the plantations and, and just in the world during those times. Absolutely. Pat asks, without a kitchen still standing, what would be a good place in the house to interpret the cooking. So um, what I've done, what I've seen done at other places, because I don't much cook unless Dontavious needs me to help him. But, um, you know, you can set up a fire pit outside. I think that's a, you know, like what I've seen the slave dwelling project do with tables mm -hmm. and sort of set up an outside kitchen space. And I think that's a really nice way of doing it. Um, a lot of houses don't like you cooking inside of the house if it's you know, a smaller house or, you know, there's fire risks and those kinds of things. But you want to add to that, Dontavious? Yeah, so to, to set up in, in the area where you would, mm. if you have the archaeology um, reports where that kitchen may have been, you could have you could easily set up a, a fire pit like we did at um, Stat Historic Stadville. Um And it's really easy. It's not a lot of digging. You just take the, the, the surface dirt up um, and then set up, the, set up your, your kitchen literally um, right there. I prefer that style more so than in the the kitchen or in the cookhouse because it's so hot in those stinking kitchens so um, true and and you get that it's still hot no matter what but it ain't nothing like a good breeze on a, when you're sweaty <laughs> that is the truth Robin says, thank you so much. Um, so you know, I have read your book and I asked you to put on the board of Weston Manor Plantation in Hopewell. I'm on fire to transform the narrative of interpreters and highlight the contributions of the enslaved on plantations into our Yay. American history. Thank you, Robin. And again, you know, I think it's really important. We've had a lot of feedback, um, you know, from people that are getting these postcards and a lot of our supporters are really worried that we're leaving the story of the Lees behind. We absolutely are not. The Lees are front and center but so are the other people that were there with them. And again, if you yeah. go back into a time machine and you go back and you visit Stratford, I guarantee that Philip Ludwell Lee, that, you know, Light Horse Harry, that they would all say that a lot of these enslaved people, I mean, that's who they saw every day. You know, mm -hmm. they have these very close relationships with a lot of these folks. And, 
you know, their story is part of the Lee story and is part of American history. So thank mm -hmm. you, Robin, for, for doing that work. Can either of you, this is from Brian, can either of you address the relationships between enslaved cooks and enslaved workers? I think we both can. Um, I know in my research that I found that the kitchen was this sort of crossroads that I kept reading these diaries of white folks that talked about how, you know, at night when the cook was up there cooking the next morning's food and, you know, finishing some things that the folks from the field, right, would come up and sort of be in that space since the kitchen's always going, right, that fire was always going. And then we would also have, you know, the folks that were enslaved in the house, the domestics, the nannies, the butlers would also then come down um, and be in that kitchen. And then you have also the white kids in that kitchen. So these kitchens were this sort of axis of, of race, of class, of field of house, um, they acted as a sort of nucleus of that plantation community. So there was a lot of relationships there. A lot of the folks in the field too would come up and sometimes sneak some of the food. And, you know, I'll let Dontavius talk a little bit about that. Like that woman snuck that chicken bag. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I know you're mad too because you love the back. You're probably That's saving my it. For your part. <laughs> you're like, when the night is over, I'm going to have a little bit of wine and eat that chicken back, and it exactly. was gone. And so, this is not the, the good grease, you know, I won't have a headache in the morning. <laughs> so true. But, and I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the like you said, it's the nucleus. It's, the, it's the, the heart of the plantation, just like the kitchens in our homes. Mm -hmm. um, it, I don't know about, about you, Kelly. Yes, I do know about you um, because you cook. <laughs> but when, when, when we host an event, if I'm just hosting friends over, especially if I'm cooking, I can have a room set up for them with the little, you know, the little mints and, and stuff. But everybody migrates to the kitchen. I'm like, I shouldn't even waste my time vacuuming or dusting that room, you know, because mm -hmm. everybody's going to be right here in the kitchen. It's so whenever true. I build my house, that's going to be my space. Um, because as you said, everybody comes to that space. Um, mm -hmm. It's part of the quarters. Although it's part of the house, it's still like part of the quarters mm -hmm. because it's not a a space wherein the Lees would have hosted a dinner party. Right. You know, but it's where the dinner party was hosted. You know. There you go. The party. I like it's that. the after party. It's the after party yeah. in the kitchen. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the cook had to be up all night making the next day's food. Mm-hmm. Um, anonymous attendee, again, <laughs> were there separate cooking gardens for the enslaved? Um, short answer, yes. Do you want to tap on that real quick? And yeah. I want to get to these questions. We've got a little bit more time here. We have nine more questions. So I want to make sure we get to all of them. So go ahead and okay. hit that Real one. quick, last, the last uh, webinar, we talked about slave gardens, the palinkas. They were land that was, that was not necessarily given to the slaves, but allowed for the slaves to use. Typically uh, refused land that cotton or, or tobacco had soaked up all the nutrients and it was kind of a way of, of, of uh, rotating those crops sometimes uh, because if you want something to grow in it, if you want your vegetables to grow, you got to mend that soil. So um, yeah, uh, they, they were, they were. Jeff asks, are there any modern dishes from today's time that are directly influenced by dishes of the enslaved peoples? Um, absolutely, yes. We can rattle off a few. I mean, Jolof rice is West African. Peanut soup, um, jambalaya, gumbo. Jolof you know. rice. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Okra and tomato soup. Tomato stew. Yep, absolutely. This is making me really hungry. I cannot do this. Again, it, looking at your food and you're sitting there eating it and it's all delicious. <laughs> was compost a thing from Margaret? Um, as an archeologist, there were trash pits behind pretty much every building that had all of the refuge in there. And, you know, having a separate space for what we would consider compost in 2020 wasn't necessarily a thing because everything was, com you know, was compost. There was a massive compost pile, you know, sort of like rotting in, in the backs of all these kitchens um, all the way across. And so, you know, you could use that for fertilizer, but you also had animal feces for that. So, you know, yes and no. It, they didn't think of it the same, but they definitely had big stinky piles of garbage everywhere. I'm thinking Brian, about it at home. I made that nasty face, but I'm thinking about it at home, and I legit have one right out my back door. See? Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, I just thought about that, and my grandma thought I was crazy, but I'm like, 
I don't want to go all the way to the end of the yard <laughs> to throw these pepper, you know, holes out. No, I'm but going like, to the, the And when we're cooking in the hearth, like, I mean, all the garbage, you were just like throwing it in, you know, yeah. throw it in the fire. Uh, yeah. Brian asks, in what ways is hearth cooking different than contemporary stove cooking? <sighs> night and day. <laughs> you say night and day, but I disagree. Really? Yeah, I disagree. Oh. It's, it's, if you you don't cook over the fire, you cook over the coals. Right. And to me, you can set on that hearth at, at Stratford, I can probably put 12 that's true. hearths. You, you we know. have a huge hearth at Stratford, so that's true. Yeah. That's so true. Uh, I can put tw on that hearth, because it's so huge, I could put probably 10 or 12 pots there. I can be roasting a huge chunk of meat, um, as well as baking, you know, in, in the bake oven there. Uh, but, so you have the ovens, you have the rotisseries, um, and then you have your stove top, which is where you pull the coals out and put them on the on the hearth. The more coals you have, the hotter your 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 temperature is, right? Um, so I just say whenever my pots aren't doing like I need them to do, I'm gonna turn it up. I'm gonna put it on high. So I get a, a shovel. Two shovels full is high. You know. One okay, Don Tavius. <laughs> I'm gonna argue with you a little bit. Going like this on the knob on the stove versus shoveling stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but to Anyways, me, we can agree, agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> that's why, that, yeah, I prefer hard cooking over cooking. Do uh, you? My, I do. Okay. I do. The flavor's better. So, fair enough, fair mess. enough. I like, see, I love cast iron. Love it. And you really yeah. can't. A, you know, you can you do some stuff on a gas stove, but you get electric and cast iron and it's a hot mess. So I, I can yeah. see where you're coming from. Anonymous attendee, another. Were there separate cooking gardens for white and black on the plantation? Yeah. Depend yeah. Depending, yeah, on, your, yeah, thing, yeah. depending on your your plantation, you had a formal kitchen garden. Um, like at Shepherd, you guys have a, a kitchen garden there um, that took care of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, with all of your herbs and spices and those delicate things that you would need to get uh, very quickly uh, versus what you get from the fields. You know, you're not going to grow potatoes in your little kitchen garden because you need a <laughs> lot of those. True. It's, and they're not very pretty either. No. no. Uh, anonymous attendee says, thank you. What a different twist on visiting Stratford Hall. I enjoyed this so much. Thank you so much. Margaret Rice says, I'm glad to hear you say that. I feel that Stratford has attempted to be honest about its role in heritage for decades. Um, they are embracing the truth of the souls that have crossed the land. Thank you both for continuing this legacy and furthering it. Thank you, Margaret Rice. It is an honor to do this work generally, and it is an honor to work at Stratford. And I think Dontavious and I can agree that the energy we spend in telling those stories, especially at that site, um, are absolutely worth everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Arlie Montgomery says, just a comment, Kelly and Dontavious, thank you both for such an educational and joyful program. Please do more of these. We will do more of these. We had over 200 people sign up tonight and each program we do, more and more people sign up and it's it's been something that has been a dream of mine for honestly over a decade to work at a plantation to be able to do this kind of programming and everything has come together beautifully. So thank you and thank you for your support. Let me see here. Um, Laniel says, I had the same experience when I visited Shirley Plantation, a spirited fill environment. Absolutely. Susan Lene says, I met Laniel yes. at Bell. I met Laniel at Bell, Bell Grove. Grove. Okay. That's, yeah. I still need to go to Bell Grove. It's right around the corner from Stratford. I, I need to get there. Susan, we're, there we're there in a couple, sometime, month? I think October. I'll let you know and you'll have an excuse to. to, to oh, no. I'll, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. All right, uh, Susan says, I agree. I prefer to cook at the hearth rather than my own kitchen oh, and can do more at the heart than in my hearth than in my modern kitchen. Man. You can yeah. make a mess, Kelly. I throw everything on the floor when I'm done. I sweep it in the fire. I can't do okay. that at home. All right, you got me at that one. If I could do that at home, I would be doing that all day because I will cook my butt off and then I turn around and it looks like a bomb went off. And that's the worst <laughs> of the evening, right? I catered for, you know, over a decade. It's like... You know, you yeah. do a wedding and you're like, I'm done. And you look around and then the and actual work starts. So, exactly. All right. A few more uh, comments and questions here. 
<laughs> Lydia says, thank you for working in history um, and your mission, Sontavius and Kelly. I appreciate being reminded of the power of food that you taught us all today. Thank you, Lydia. Rebecca, oh, Becky Childress, once again, friends, this was captivating, informative program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Becky Childress, for being a constant supporter of Stratford and all that we do. Susan yeah. Peters says, thank you for being honest. I was shocked when I went to the Henry Clay estate and they denied that people were enslaved there. They were apparently servants by choice. I am writing a bio on a person who's enslaved there and I know that was not by choice. That's another program in itself. <laughs> I am sorry that happened and. But it continues to happen. If I can just, if I can really quickly, it, it continues to happen inadvertently. When we mm -hmm. use, when we, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna speak to a firestorm that was created in December um, by a particular author who wrote a, an article about how we interpret these kitchens. <laughs> um, it, it, we have to own it. We have to own the interpretation. If the place was a plantation that had people working there as enslaved laborers, that kitchen was not occupied by a European man or woman. If you have resources to bring somebody in to interpret that space, do that. If you don't and you can't bring them in, at the least, talk about the people who were working there. No mm -hmm. more of these programs that, that are like cooking guild things for the hobbyists that's disrespectful to the people who lived in that space. Um, we, we need to, to interpret these spaces for what they were, and they were workspaces. Um, now, cooking gills are wonderful because it's, it's so much information that you can learn, but these people, they have a particular narrative that they really want to tell, and it does not include the people like um, Caesar or Hercules, you know. So that that's 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 one of that's a, a good way to kind of kind of turn the fire up on Dontavius's <laughs> attitude is, or soapbox because we have to honor these people uh, for the legacy that they left. Uh, if you like to cook and it's a hobby of yours and you just love to do that, that's wonderful. <laughs> but still, mention that an enslaved person would have been doing this mm -hmm. to. To, and that's all you could say. I and said not this by the last choice. Time. Huh? <laughs> yes. And not by choice. Absolutely. Yeah, they were not here by choice. Yeah, they no, absolutely. And choice. I think, you know, for any of you too, a lot of you I saw were, um, you know, people that were coming from museums, I, you know, if you, if any of you want to have one of these programs where you have someone like Dontavius or some of our other colleagues come and do, you know, a hearth cooking demonstration, even a Zoom talk like this, um, please just contact me and any of you that sent me your your contact information for one of these postcards please <clears throat> um, email me at kdeets that's k-d-e-t-z at stratfordhall.org and give me your information again in case for some reason i lose all the the comments but also email me to get in touch with dontavius to get in touch with other people that we know that do this work that like you said you know these these people that do this work right um as you said, Dontavius, y'all are gigging. I mean, it is like trying to hustle up enough money to do the work that only then pays for your travel there, only then pays for the clothes that you're wearing to do the most authentic job possible. Support these African-American interpreters because they are literally beating the ground, sweating, working their butts off to tell these stories, to make America a better place, to get these stories out, to be told, to remember the ancestors, and to start conversations about ra racial recognition reconciliation and healing and you need to be able to do that with not people that look like me in a room but people that also look like Dontavius and others having a community having that space occupied authentically is incredibly important so please I'm gonna get us on a soapbox here but please please let me know if you need the contact information for any of the interpreters that I know or Dontavius knows because the work needs to be done and we know who mm. can do it. So mm. absolutely. And, and it's a dedication that you have to have to do this work. 
Um, I have a friend who, who does the same work and only had enough money, funded their own travel, right? But only had enough money for the travel to the space or to, to the, to the uh -huh. site um, in the hopes that when they got there that they would be paid um, after completing the work. That didn't happen. It was one of those, oh, the check is in the mail kind of situations. They were stranded hours from home and no way of being able to get back home. But because of their dedication to this work, they took that chance. Uh, of course, you know, things ended up working out, but it was a huge inconvenience to be stuck for hours, not knowing where you're going to, how you're going to get back home. And it still wasn't even enough to truly cover the, the, the car. So it's, 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 a labor of love mm -hmm. and we do it because if we don't do it ain't nobody else gonna do it we can already see that we can see that i think that's a beautiful way to end the program uh lastly michael and susan uh susan says great program michael says thank you so much for this i truly appreciate it. we must honor the enslaved people engaged with this history instead of whitewashing it i agree 100 percent. i think so does dontavius i want to um, invite you all to take a the questionnaire that will be sent out to you um, after this program probably tomorrow and you will have a chance to win some free tickets um, i might even after this one throw in a super special um one for some lucky winner of maybe a private tour of the kitchen and collections and and a little you know tour of the the food history at stroudford and i want again to encourage you all to go to our website to uh, check out our programs, to email me your address. I will mail you one of these beautiful postcards um, so you know exactly when our next programs are. The next program is on October 3rd, so it's not a Tuesday. We've been rocking these Tuesdays. We're breaking away from the Tuesday. It's gonna be on a Saturday night. It's Dr. Nancy Siegel, and she's talking about food, politics, and colonial women. Uh, she has got, she's a professor at Townsend University, and she has got some absolutely stunning images and stories and recipes about the ways in which, about the, the food that these colonial women were eating during the colonial era, but also the ways in which these colonial, uh, you know, women of means um, used food as a way to politicize their being as a oppressed person in colonial society. So there's more to the story um, here. Please tune in next time. And thank you to Mars Wrigley um, for the future programs and for tuning in tonight. You've been great supporters and for, for Virginia Humanities for supporting this particular program and future programs. This is exciting. And thank you, John Tavius, for being amazing as usual. And I need to go eat some food, and you probably do too. So I do. I'm famished. <laughs> Don't eat that bread behind you. Uh <laughs> for those of you that are still on the inside joke earlier. <laughs> Meet Bertha. It's gotten so much worse. But she's beautiful. So there's a running joke. You'll see Bertha in the next program. Um, that was a loaf of bread that was supposed to be a prop for the cooking demonstration that ended up in my back seat the whole time. And we joked about it. And I sent it to him. And it molded on the way down to South Carolina. And he's now tortured me with it. And it's in every single one of his programs. It's right in the background. So hello, Bertha. Good night, she's, everyone. She's going to live in my office now. I brought her from home. She's pretty much a rock. I mean, I think yeah. you could probably sell that as penicillin if COVID gets too much worse. Anyways, good night, yeah. everyone. Thank you so much for <laughs> tuning in. Excuse Dontavious and my silliness. Um, we're good friends and tease each other constantly. So good night, everyone. Good night, Dontavious. And good night. I will see you all on October 3rd. Thank you.